Uh, again, the name of the title is SREA Startup, uh, Lessons I Learned While at LinkedIn. So a quick overview of who I am. At one point, I was a computational chemist. I did sysadmin work for a while. I did development work for a while, mostly in Perl and Java. Uh, Perl dates me a little bit. Uh, I was an SRE of multiple flavors. Uh, the name didn't really come into fruition until about 10 years ago, give or take, uh, but I'll talk about that more in a second. I've worked for big companies, I've worked for small companies, and at one point I left tech to become a chef, a uh, full-on chef, not the software. Um, and yeah, I went to Le Cordon Bleu, I went to a program in Italy, a program in France. So yeah, full-on chef, I worked at a restaurant in Italy, it was awesome. Uh, but I'm back, uh, tech pays a lot better. So. Um, the basic question I want to try and answer is, does, does SRE work at a startup? And without jumping ahead, the answer is yes, with a caveat. It depends, without trying to be pedantic, it depends on how you define SRE, and depends on how you define startup, believe it or not. So a quick outline. I'll talk about uh, a quick definition of what SRE is, in case you don't know, then my experience at LinkedIn, and then my experience at Matterport with some lessons from essentially both at the end. So what exactly is SRE? It stands for Site Reliability Engineer or Engineering, whichever one you want. It started at Google in roughly 2003 by a guy named Ben Trainer, And he had a great quote for uh, describing it, saying, this is essentially what happens when you ask a software developer to do an operations job. They have a different way of looking things, uh, as has been stated, stated many times. They don't off, often they don't want to do the same manual thing more than once. There's a, 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 it's a member of the team. It is not a separate group. And how this relates to DevOps, I will talk about in just a quick second. But it is a member of the team, much like when you build a web app and you have front end engineers and back end engineers. One might be more familiar with JavaScript and the latter might be more uh, familiar with, say, uh, databases. Together, they can create an application. When you add an SRE uh, onto the entire team, Together, they can build a reliable application. It doesn't move responsibility to just this guy on the team. The team as a whole is still responsible for the application from coding, design and coding, all the way through staging to customer visible. The hope is that each team is now more um, self-reliant and self-sufficient. You still need somebody to support the core infrastructure. So for example, if you are running on Red Hat 6, and you want to upgrade to Red Hat 7, who's going to do that? There is still some core amount of work that has to happen that is kind of independent of the development teams. I'm not going to talk about that quite as much, but you should be able to uh, glean some lessons from most of the work at uh, Matterport. DevOps. So DevOps has a whole bunch of uh, definitions, and people define it a bunch of different ways. So big caveat, these are my definitions based on my experience with mostly SRE. If you have a DevOps team, depending on what you call DevOps, you're probably doing it wrong. If you have a central team that because they do more coding, but still is responsible for all your releases, all of your deployments, all of your config management, that is just renamed operations to be DevOps and you haven't fixed the core problem. If you look at what DevOps is trying to solve, is to break down this wall between classic op uh, development and classic operations where development would just throw code over the wall and somebody else would manage it for the customers. So if you have a team, it doesn't matter that is responsible for all of that, it doesn't matter what you call it. DevOps is a paradigm, not a job title. If you've developed, if you're doing DevOps within your company, it's much like Agile. If you have Agile methods, it's not like you're either, this guy is the Agile person, and that, why, that one's doing waterfall. The whole company is doing Agile at some level or not, and the same was with DevOps. It is a spectrum, and, you, and each team could be a more on one side and more or more on the other. One of my favorite quotes is from Werner Vogels, from uh, the CTO from Amazon, and he says, if you build it, you run it uh, in production as implied. Um, and the idea is, if you have code and it's going to be visible to customers, then the infrastructure you run it on, the code that runs it, all of it together is what affects the customer. And you, the developer needs to be involved all the way from, again, design and production, design and development, all the way to production. 
So SRE is an implementation of the DevOps paradigm. So what happened at LinkedIn? I joined in uh, late 2000, whoops. I joined in uh, late 2010. Uh, at that point, there was a single application operations team that did uh, all of the production uh, type work for the application code. And there was a central NOC that did the monitoring. They were only live 24-5, and then a pager was passed around. The point of this is that app ops carried the pager, not the developers. So if there was a problem with the code, the app ops team was responsible for trying to figure out how to fix it Saturday at 2 o'clock in the morning. Developers were not involved. There were other operations teams. There was a sysadmin team that was responsible for essentially operating system and below. So rack and stack reported into them, uh, network team, DBAs, et cetera. The release process was relatively complicated. There was a release every other week. There were complex dependencies between all these different applications and a central team that would manage all of that. So if too many teams, uh, too many products wanted to deploy their stuff at the same time, the release team would say, sorry, we are essentially full this week. You have to wait for two weeks. There, were, uh, there was a centralized REST service that managed all the configuration. And the important part of that is it had a very simple ACL. You either had access or you didn't. What this meant was a developer who didn't know how the configuration was different between staging and production had to ask somebody. They couldn't self-serve. They couldn't see for themselves what the difference, difference between uh, development, staging, and production was. Simple things like number of threads. They couldn't see it. So what did we do to fix it? We implemented SRE, and one of the first things they did uh, right before I got there is they changed the name. Names can matter or they cannot. One big thing you can do with changing a name, much like when you rebrand a company, it's a signal that things weren't working and we're making changes. So the change in name was a signal to the rest of LinkedIn that the current process for how we release, how we manage our systems isn't working and we're trying to fix it. SRE was broken up into a bunch of individual teams that would focus on each dev team. At that point, there were roughly five different major dev teams for example, a team that did all the front end applications, a team that managed the data infrastructure, which included the graph database that ran uh, all of LinkedIn's data, a team for notifications, et cetera. Initially, I was really opposed to it, to be quite honest. I was opposed to this breaking up of SRE because I thought this would harm the uh, communication between the different SREs themselves. It turns out it does have an impact on that communication, but the communication challenges between SRE and the developers is a far more important problem to fix. SREs, because they come from a like, uh, similar background, it is easy for them to communicate even when they're geographically spread. We implemented SALT. Uh, the specifics of SALT was because we were mostly a Python shop. Uh, LinkedIn is mostly Java, but the tooling is mostly Python. Um, SALT, Chef, Python, or SALT, uh, Ansible, et cetera, it doesn't really matter. The point is we implemented a system that allowed for more coding, and less manual fixes um, and manual changes. Eventually, we had SRE teams for internal products. We had Git, we had Confluence and Jira, we had testing systems, we had release systems, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, eventually, there were SRE teams for the non-customer visible products. Since, as I mentioned, SRE is essentially an implementation of DevOps, while these were changes were happening within the operations department, there were changes happening within development as well. They simplified this complicated release branching uh, structure into uh, a trunk model. Essentially, if you check it in, it's going to be customer visible at the next release. Uh, and I'll talk about how you can do far, fu uh, far future uh, changes um, without necessarily affecting the customer right away. Devs now had access to configuration data. The configuration was seen as code. Configuration was now checked in essentially right next to all of the code so the developers could see it. This wasn't as easy as it sounded. One of the big changes that had to come along with this was encryption of secrets. You obviously don't want to check in database passwords, um, but you do need all of that code in there. So having a system that would encrypt things and uh, spread the keys around to the production systems, et cetera, that was done by a, a, a tooling team. There was a richer testing platform involved so we could move away from manual testing into more automated testing, but there were some complexities with 
do you want the test uh, to happen uh, right away, uh, which was called pre-commit, uh, within essentially five minutes, or do you want longer tests? And there were different implications for uh, whether code was rolled back, whether future releases were blocked. The implications of failing those different levels were different. Devs were able to deploy directly to production. Uh, this was a big, big, sorry, I hit the power. Okay, uh, so devs could deploy um, directly to production now, um, which means they weren't uh, bottlenecked by people anymore. They could figure out, they could figure out if, um, if their code is ready or not, and they weren't dependent on a specific set of people uh, deploying their stuff. But they didn't deploy to the entire cluster at once, they would deploy to a cluster, um, and that it's to a canary that then would then deploy to the entire cluster. This made it relatively simple, uh, safe for them to make their changes because they could essentially preview them and then roll it out wider. One of the things I mentioned was the simplified trunk model um, and how do you develop for the far future? And this is done with uh, A/B tests. LinkedIn had a very very rich A/B testing platform. Uh, feature flags, uh, you can call it whatever you want. Essentially, there were conditional blocks that said if your customer A, uh, sorry, member A, you can see this new code or not. What would happen is they would roll out the code and then the, they would turn on the feature flag for the development group and then all of engineering, all of LinkedIn, 1%, et cetera, et cetera. This allowed them to roll out changes slowly. Um, the idea was it is easier to roll back from 50% to 1% than it is to roll back code especially when the code has all these complex interdependencies. And then devs were involved in some of the on-call. This varied greatly by team. Uh, mostly the dev managers that were more on board um, uh, got their devs more uh, into the on-call. Other teams lagged a bit. So the self-service. If you want the developers to be more involved, again, breaking this people bottleneck is really, really important. So you need them to be able to make changes where they see fit. Automated code metrics was one of the big things uh, that, that they first did. So developers didn't know, have to know the details of how to send metrics. All they had to know was they had to annotate their methods with a, a specific routine that said send metric A with value foo. And the rest of the library would figure out which Kafka topic, which Kafka topic to send to, um, the details of retrying, et cetera. They didn't have to worry about it. And then next to that was a system called InGraphs, which was essentially a, a display system. Now we have all this data that the devs are just adding all kinds of data. We need to be able to see it. And we need to be able to group them different ways based on what the developers want, not what some central group wants. So there were dashboards that were in YAML, format doesn't matter, but there were dashboards that were checked in that developers could change and say, these are the 20 graphs are most important for my application, and then share that with uh, other team members, uh, other people within the company, et cetera. There are some quirks with this. Um, there were no limits on the number of metrics sent. There was one team that sent 30,000 metrics per instance per host. Uh, they consumed um, about 5% of all of LinkedIn's metric infrastructure. Uh, this was significant. Um, and you'll see this again with some of the stuff I did with Matterport. You have to trust that the devs will fix these problems. These highlight communication problems within development and additional problems between uh, SRE or whatever you want to call it, whatever manages the core infrastructure and these different development teams. You have to be able to solve those problems and move forward. And then, um, on top of the graphing system was alerts. The developers need to be able to say, I made this major change in this piece of code. Having an alert on 10 no longer makes sense. It now should be five. Again, they had self-service and were able to make uh, those changes themselves. So why is this important? Implementing is, uh, a new paradigm is hard. You need management support. You are going to be impacting how developers do their work and how much work they can spend on uh, customer-facing products, uh, customer facing features. So having management support is really important, especially in the transition. The transition at LinkedIn was on the order of uh, 18 to 24 months, depending on how you look at it. 
Um, in some respects, it never finished. Um, so it does take a while, and uh, the management needs to be aware of it and needs to be able to support you. We changed a lot of things that allowed us to grow. It was painful when I got there, but it was manageable. Releasing every other week is not horrible. At the time I joined, it was several hundred applications, and we would max out a release at somewhere between 50 and 70, depending on the complexity. So generally, teams weren't blocked. Uh, but as we grew, it, become a, it became a bigger and bigger problem. As I've mentioned several times, self-service is really important. Uh, developers need to be able to make their own changes. If LinkedIn can do it, so can your startup. So this leads to, oh god, I can't even see it at all. Um, so there's blue text, um, which is the Matterport logo on a black background. Um, yeah, it didn't work. Um, it works fine here. So who, uh, what is Matterport? Uh, we do 3D visualization of spaces. Mostly it's uh, residential real estate. You can kind of, th we make a big splash in VR, um, but there's a, a web browser as well. We have over 150 employees. There were about 20 when I joined. So it has seen a whole lot of growth uh, and with it a whole new set of problems. Uh, we're based in Silicon Valley. The technology we use is we sell a physical camera which has firmware that needs to get updated. We have client-side technology, JavaScript, and a Unity plugin. We have C++ and uh, Python code. We use Salt, obviously, to power most of the infrastructure, and we run everything on AWS. And lastly, we participate in the um, uh, startup micro economy. Um, we use a bunch of other startups that, well, we, they don't use us too much, but um, we use a whole bunch of third parties for log aggregation, uh, Python exceptions, et cetera. So after I started, I got to peek behind the curtain and see what was really going on. So now I'm going to talk about what things looked like when I first got there. There was a lot of operations work. It was done by a single developer. He was the only one that understood the entire stack um, because of some of the complexity that, granted, he introduced himself. He wrote tooling as needed and didn't really think about where it needed to go in the future. Not all these tools were checked in. There were no metrics. There were a bunch of Snowflake servers that had configurations that, again, were not checked in. There was minimal monitoring, essentially, is a site up or down. That was basically it. The releases were painful. They were done by the same person. There was a blue-green kind of the system where one was live, one was dormant. They would put the new code on the dormant one and then flip everything over. Obviously, that doesn't happen right away. Um, lagging changes to the now dormant system, um, to the database, or the whole stack was replicated, including the database. So any manual changes had to be, any changes, lagging changes had to be manually copied over to the new system. Uh, there wasn't enough communication. It was an hour plus of downtime, so it had to be done after hours. And there were hand edits made to the change, made to the code in production. So I started and I said, we need to fix all of this, which quickly led to being a little overwhelmed. Um, how many people do not understand what this means? Because I, I might be dating myself. Uh, so, does this sound familiar? Um, so this is relatively normal for startups, right? Startups start with dev. They have an idea for what they want to do, um, and they develop this product. Things like uh, configuration, et cetera, that comes later. So these things, uh, sorry, so customers start coming in, and these things start becoming more important. And the work to support it generally happens organically. And this was just a challenge I was looking for. So what changes did I make? Well, first things first is because there were so many tribbles to manage, um, you have to prioritize which things to handle first. Uh, simplifying is extremely important if you want all these other developers who have no idea of how the production systems and the staging systems look like, if you want them to be involved, if it's super complicated, it creates this large barrier to entry. I filed lots of JIRA tickets. One thing I tell my team is to look at JIRA a little bit differently than a way, of a way for people to send you things to do. It's also a way to communicate out, these are the things I'm working on, these are the things that are most important, these are the things that are next. So you, have to, you can look at JIRA um, or a bug tracking system both ways. Improving communication, um, what would happen is developer would go with this ops person, would go into the room by himself and he would start to release and come out when it was done. That was essentially it. Um, as I mentioned before, more management buy-in because there, during the transition especially, there is going to be an impact for developers. So getting management on board is critical. Lastly is a culture change. At an all-hands meeting, I said we all own the site. The idea 
that a single operations team owns production is inherently wrong. There is code that's being deployed. There are people that are watching different things. And if you're from California and you ride Caltrain, um, you've probably heard the see, see something, say something. Um, I'm sure other systems have the very similar thing. If you have a lot more eyeballs uh, looking at the site and know that they're empowered to say something when they see something odd, um, that helps spread the load across the entire company. So what's first is prioritizing the important things. If you've ever heard of uh, Mikey Dickerson, he's given a couple of talks, I believe, at Lisa at SRECon. He talks about this hierarchy of reliability. Um, if you don't do the base things first, going up the chain doesn't mean anything. So that leads to my hierarchy of needs. Metrics monitoring were most important. We had no data at this point. I, did, I couldn't tell you if things were a little bit worse or a lot worse than the previous week. Um, I just knew they were, it was binary. If things were running or they weren't. Uh, reproducible builds. So this hand editing of code in production, that needed to stop. A schedule of people could know what was going to happen, um, which uh, led to more communication. So they know that they had to plan that this change is coming. The reason why that was so important is not just changing things for uh, developers. Customer support has to be in the loop. Marketing might have to send communication to customers. Customers themselves have to know that they're going to potentially be impacted. Doing all that communication involves a lot of people. So starting with the communication within the company is the first step. And obviously more documentation. Uh, dev ownership, uh, self-service, which included more, um, sorry, Automated testing is what I meant to say, not just uh, manual testing. And then the last thing was I can't do it all by myself, so I need to build a team. So metrics and monitoring. Uh, getting data to mine your systems is extremely important. I use Datadog. It doesn't really matter. The important thing is it use StatsD. Because we have these different technologies internally, having an open layer where they can choose what client works best for them um, was really important. So the C++ guys could do something different than the Python guys, or even the different Python teams could choose different libraries as long as they admitted the stat state. Uh, to get this started, it was a grassroots effort. So I got a key developer to look at Datadog. I showed them some key metrics that I was starting to accumulate for the system itself. I showed them how to build dashboard, how this was beneficial, and how we could make changes in his code. And he started making small incremental changes and gradually started adding more metrics for uh, our custom code. And lastly, uh, giving access to everybody. As I mentioned in the uh, all hands meeting, uh, everybody ha owns a site. So even people in accounting were given Datadog accounts, which seemed a little odd. Um, getting through that was uh, interesting. Um, why do I need this? Why does it matter? Uh, just trust me, uh, hang on to it. You might need it someday. Uh, expanding access to the monitoring system. If you don't know how you're, if you as a developer don't know how you're monitoring it, monitoring your code, then you don't know what you're missing and what needs to be improved. And again, more simplification, we were sending data to a bunch of third parties that nobody was looking at. As an example, we were sending data to New, uh, New Relic and nobody looked at it. Nobody even had a login. So things like that had to go uh, so that um, it was, again, easier for the developers to see what was going on. Builds. Uh, at the time I joined, we used SVN and Git, simplifying that so everybody used the same SCN system was important. We started with BuildBot for some relatively simple building. Um, this was great, but it wasn't self-service enough. The Python code we deployed directly from Git, uh, this wasn't great, but at least it was reproducible. Um, the deployment versions had the, the small Git hash or Git described long, um, so it was reproducible. Um, it wasn't built, not great, but there were bigger problems. Again, prioritization is important. So then we implemented Circle. At first, it was for automated testing and not so much for the build artifacts themselves. Eventually, we started using the artifacts, uh, mostly tarballs. Um, Debian packages would be nice, but not all developers were on board with that. But a development artifact that could then be deployed, um, which led to more self-service uh, BuildBot at the time we implemented this had no concept of a config file within the repo. It was all centrally managed. So Circle helped us uh, do more self-service. And as I mentioned, um, uh, not enough SCM within uh, the core code. 
So all the salt changes were now committed to Git. This is all relatively uh, normal stuff, but these were a bunch of changes that had to be made. Uh, unit tests, if you don't know how salt runs at its core, it uses YAML, uh, then Jinja, then Python. So just doing tests to validate that the YAML works was one big step, and just getting those tests to be automated on every check-in was a big hurdle, uh, was a hurdle that every other developer and or infra person didn't have to cross. So it, it, something they could just expand upon. Again, simplifying the salt code. If I want developers to be able to look at this code, if they look at it and say, oh my god, I do not understand any of that, they are likely not going to make changes. So improving the release process was next. I completely opened up all of the non-prod environments. If you want access, let me know. Uh, automating that is on the list. It just hasn't happened yet. But everybody has access. As I mentioned, with this 30,000 metrics by one system, developers will trip on each other. They will trip on the infrastructure as a whole. You have to deal with that. Developers will learn, and they will um, be able to adapt. Releases have to be doing, done during business hours. The biggest reason is if you have a problem, the person who wrote the code needs to be available so they can figure out what's going on. Releases have to be backwards compatible. So if you have a problem, a rollback isn't a disaster of trying to roll back a database, for example, at the same time. Again, more JIRA. This provides, again, communication channels not just in, but out as well. Uh, a simple dashboard is created. These are all the current releases in flight. Uh, plans in the wiki that would show exactly what steps we were doing. And then related to that uh, was Slack. So we would say we were on step two on this wiki, on this release plan. There were meetings held, so again, to improve communication. And then over time, we did uh, more improvements. We eventually moved it to every week. Uh, something I mentioned early on is change is hard, and doing everything at once can be very painful. And that's why this has been a bunch of incremental steps. At this point, the, the releases have become so routine that management doesn't even question why we need to do it. They're just like, oh, OK, another release this week. No big deal. Which means that management is now more on board with making even more changes. We eventually got rid of the planning meeting. Uh, everything is in Jira and the wiki with more Slack integration now with bots that integrate directly within some of the automation. We use feature flags so that we can roll out new code and limit the impact, um, hopefully to just internal employees and then a subset of customers who are more, um, who are less risk averse, uh, and then eventually to everybody. And some products have developers that can deploy directly to prod. Again, baby steps. Uh, this has been a long process, um, but it's a, whole, uh, it's a whole lot better than it was. Communication is a big thing. Slack is used everywhere. Slack is the basis of a lot of communication. One of the big things is the integration with bots mean that you don't have to say, I just ran task A. You can integrate Slack, you can do Slack integration directly into whatever automation created um, uh, operation A. We created a channel specifically for all release changes. Again, I mentioned this wiki that said we are now on step six. And so we would just post, hey, we are on step six if somebody needs to follow along. There was a different channel for outages, and the key reason for this is that executives would monitor the outage channel, not the release channel, because as we started being more detailed with the plans, um, the amount of chatter within the release channel got uh, worse and worse, uh, more and more. I shouldn't say it's bad. More documentation, lots more JIRA, and then dev ownership. Getting a circle was a big deal because they could integrate their own tests, change their tests as they saw fit, root access to all developers for all non, sorry, to all development hosts. A subset of them have root access to the staging boxes, and then a smaller set have root access to the production uh, boxes. How somebody gets determined whether they have root access to prod is a communication between a bunch of people, their manager, um, the tech lead of that group. A bunch of people have to say, yeah, that, that sounds fine. It's not a formal process, it's just yeah, a bunch of people give a thumbs up. Uh, more access to Datadog and these various third parties. We started building the team. Uh, the idea of the developers being embedded within the team, I started doing, but then my team shrank. Uh, somebody left, 
Um, we lost a contractor. So it was a little bit harder with such a small team. For them to be in the stand-ups of every product uh, is very, very difficult. And this goes back to the original question. Does SRE work at a stand, uh, startup? It depends on how you define SRE and uh, a startup. At 150 people, we are borderline startup at this point, uh, but my team has not kept up um, to speed. Um, we did a lot more ticket triage, so things didn't feel like a back hole. There's a lot more left to do. Um, as I mentioned, not all developers can deploy all products. Um, not all, very few developers make PRs to the actual infrastructure code salt. Um, improving that means simplifying it much more. We have some automation. We have very little autonomous systems. So things don't just happen. Somebody has to run a thing which does 50 things, but they still have to remember to run that one thing. Uh, again, baby steps. And the rest would be a lot more slides. So the lessons learned, patience. It takes a long time to make these changes. Don't be afraid of failure. Uh, respect your ancestors. People had to make changes, or people had to make decisions based on the business at the time. Looking back two years, or five years, or 10 years, and understanding all those business drivers is very difficult. And at some point, you are going to be the one they're going to look back on. Why didn't you just automate X? Smart, start small and iterate. Shared experience with failure is more uh, valuable than preaching from a pulpit. In my experience, blah, blah, blah always works. If you can go to develop a lead developer and say, remember when this thing failed? That is a lot more powerful than trying to uh, maybe misapply an experience, from, especially from a different company. Hiring is always hard. Uh, use data to drive decisions. Um, again, get management on board. Grassroots efforts from some technology changes really helps spread that amongst their peers. And again, SRE is an implementation of DevOps, so it's not just SRE or operations that has to change. Development as a whole needs to change as well. And there is constant learning and teaching. Things will change. Again, respect your ancestors because you will be the ancestor at some point. So. Any questions with one more thing we're hiring? Um, and the closing talk is very related, so you should all attend. And OK, real question and answers. And by the way, there's some notes at the end. These will be posted somewhere with some more things to look up. OK, any questions? Please use the uh, microphone in the middle of the room to ask your questions. We have uh, about uh, 10 minutes or so. Sorry, quick and somewhat stupid question. Paul yep. Flint up from Vermont, or down from Vermont. Um, you were saying you mostly Debian. So when were you distributing root, you weren't really distributing root. You were distributing sudo. sudo yes. OK. Sorry. Uh, root, didn't even... root access, yes. Yeah, OK. Yes. Because the cool thing about sudo is yeah. you can figure out who did it. Yep, exactly. Um, yeah, that's uh, to the last point I made about education. Um, I've done a lot of things. I've done a lot of bad things. I've done a lot of good things. And trying to educate not just all the development, but uh, my peers. Um, my team is relatively junior. Uh, they don't have a whole lot of experience, um, which has been great. They don't bring a whole lot of preconceptions with them. But there's a bunch of things that I take for granted that trying to educate them. Um, running sudo minus i, um, that sounds cool, but uh, trying to explain to them, for example, the idea of uh, logging, everything that happens so you can figure out when things went sideways, why it went sideways. Yep. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Niall Murphy. I work in a chocolate factory. Um, I have, uh, I guess I have one question, which is, well, first of all, thanks for bigging up my talk. Mm -hmm. Secondly. Uh, is there anything about your time as a chef which informed <laughs> your um, return to technical Sorry, classes? that I would like to return to or? Uh, <laughs> no, anything about your time as a chef that has informed how you conduct your, yourself in the technical arena, your current job? Um, a chef uh, specifically, no. Um, Leaving industry A to go to industry B, that was very interesting. Um, 
when you, especially when you've been in the industry for a long period of time, you have this built-in knowledge base that you can sometimes take for granted. When you have to leave all that behind, especially at, um, without going into details, I didn't leave, I, I left tech relatively recently, um, so I wasn't 20. Um, I was a bit older, so it was a much harder change to make. And so a lot of my preconceptions, um, it was interesting to see the preconceptions from tech that just naturally went into um, uh, chef. Uh, the chef at the restaurant I worked with, he would often hey, say, hey, can you fix me with fix blah, blah, blah on my Windows machine? Um, trying to explain to him that really wasn't my background, but I thought you were uh, a computer guy. Okay, sure. Um, so relearning that at uh, an older age um, with all this background, that was very interesting. So that has affected uh, one of the big things I keep mentioning with the, throughout my talk is communication. Telling people this is what I'm doing and this is why um, helps uh, remove some of these preconceptions that, sorry, these, um, these things that you have just kind of inside you that you don't think to uh, necessarily verbalize. questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you.